Okay, so you've seen this image. It's the banner image on Canvas. And what we're looking at is in fact a weir. It's a very large weir spanning the Colorado River into Back Canyon. And um, you could think of this as a run of river dam, um, but a dam and a weir are kind of, kind of the same thing. The idea of a weir though is water flows over it. Water doesn't flow over all dams, right? Some dams, we don't want, want water to flow over them. We want that water to stay behind them. Um, and so we'll talk about the kinds of weirs associated with, with this type of design. And our learning objectives. Well, first we're gonna introduce what weirs are and how we use them. We'll use the conservation of energy equation to derive the quote, ideal weir equation. We'll describe various kinds of weirs and associated weir equations, which basically relates the depth of flow upstream of a weir to the discharge. Weirs create simplified hydraulic conditions, namely critical flow depth um, over the weir by causing a choke in backwater. Um, and using the simplified flow conditions, we're able to create a fairly accurate relationship between the depth of flow upstream of the weir, the weir dimensions, um, and discharge. Then we will apply this to actually design weirs and estimate discharge. So let's take a few minutes to learn about weirs a little bit more from practical engineering. The water will drain off the sharp crest. This part of the flow is Sorry about that. Someone was rocking out. Historically, mills relied on water to drive saws, grinding wheels, and other equipment, raising the water level of the river can also allow boats and ships to navigate areas that were otherwise more accessible. Finally, having control of the river can help mitigate the damaging impacts of flow. But how do we get this type of control over the level in the body of water? Dan Brady, and this is practical engineering. On today's episode, we're talking about weirs. This video is sponsored by Skillshare, the best way to learn new skill online. More on that. A weir is a small dam built across a river to control the upstream water. Weirs have been used for ages to control the flow of water in streams, rivers, and other waterways. Unlike large dams, which create reservoirs, the goal of building a weir across a river isn't to create storage, but only to gain some control over the water level. Over time, the term weir has taken on a more general definition in engineering to apply to any hydraulic control structure that allows water to flow over its top. Christ. In fact, the spillways of many large dams use weirs as control structures. So, how do they work? If you watch my previous video on the basics of open channel hydraulics, you'll remember that for subcritical flow, that is, slow, tranquil flow seen in most rivers, the depth is controlled by downstream conditions. That means adding a weir across the river will increase the water level upstream, but by how much depends on the flow. This is the equation for flow over a weir. We're not going to do any calculations here, but it's important to know the factors that govern the performance of our hydraulic structure. This equation says that the amount of flow that passes over a weir depends on three factors. The length of the weir, the height of the water level above the crest of the weir, and this coefficient, which changes depending on the geometry of the weir. The graph of a hydraulic structure's flow versus water level is called its gradient, and this is the rate of curve for a typical weir. In many cases, a weir is a passive structure, meaning that once it's installed, there's no way to change this rating. And that's not always ideal. Streams and rivers are subject to tremendous variability in flow. A hydraulic structure may normally flow a small amount, but in flooding conditions, be asked to pass incredible volumes of water. With a passive structure and fixed rating, that variability in flow means tremendous variability in the water that flows through. During a flood, a weir may back up water badly enough to cause damage in the street. If you're using a weir for a spillway on a dam, you might have to build your dam much higher just to handle the water level that occurs during very rare but extreme cases, increasing the overall cost of the structure. Ideally, hydraulic structures used to control water level would have a flat rating, meaning over a wide range of flows, you only get small changes in water. So, how can we flatten this curve? 
Going back to the real equation, there are only two other parameters available to increase the flow for a given water surface. We can prove the geometry of a weir to increase its efficiency. Different shapes of weirs can pass flow more efficiently and thus have a higher discharge coefficient. But this has a practical limit. The most efficient shape for a weir is to match the curve that the water will take off the sharp crest. This part of the flow is called the weir's map, and the shape that matches it is called the ocean. With OG crested weirs, we can get discharge coefficients as high as around four, but that's pretty much the limit. The other parameter we can change is the length of the weir, but in many locations, the available footprint for the weir is a fixed size that can't be increased. Even if the footprint isn't fixed, increasing the length of the weir can add significant costs. Of course, this challenge is easy to address if we allow for restrictions with moving parts. Many dams and spillways have large gates or valves to control flow. There are a wide variety of types of control valves using hydraulic structures, including press gates that act like weirs that can be raised or lowered. The benefit is that the structure's capacity can be increased while flows are high by opening gates and then decreased when flows return back to normal. Controlled structures provide more flexibility in how our constraints can help back, essentially turning a static rating curve into a family. Decrease when flows Just real quick, control. this is control the design at Redlands Power Canal. It's an OG weir, and they have these gates um, that raise and lower to back water up if flows low, or um, to yeah, basically to change the the depth of water versus discharge relationship. In the case of the Colorado River, um, maybe they want water to be deeper. Deeper water means you've got more head entering your canal, and you're diverting more water. So there's some different reasons. Um, he's thinking kind of a, from a flight control standpoint. You don't want a river and a weir in a river to cause more backwater and flooding behind it. Um, but often in our area, we're interested in, you know, for, during low flows, creating more heads so we can maintain diversion rates and flow rates in canals. Provide more flexibility in how our gates for these can help back, essentially turning a static rating curve into a family curve that can be selected from to meet operational goals. Of course, control outlets come with a major disadvantage of increased complexity, and in many cases, requiring an actual person be available 24 7 to open gates and make releases based on inputs. So, what if we can get the benefit of a control outlet without the disadvantages of increased complexity? operational obligation. Well, there's one more trick that hydraulic engineers have up their sleeves. Remember when before I said you could only fit a certain length of weir within a fixed footprint? That's not completely true. We can actually fold a weir to get more length within a given space. This is called a non-linear weir, and it's used in situations where you want greater discharge within a given footprint, but without the need for actively controlled outputs. To show how this works, I've built a spoon and some model weirs. This first weir just goes directly across the flume, no bends. All of the water level in the flume, first using the straight. Now with the same flow rate, I'll replace the linear weir with the folded weir. This has just about twice as much weir length in the same footprint. You can see that even though the weir is passing the same amount of flow, the water level of the stream is lower, almost half the distance to the crest from the original level. We flatten the rating, allowing for greater discharge at a lower water level. Nonlinear weirs with folded cycles like this are called labyrinth weirs, and they're becoming more common as hydraulic control structures. There are also rectangular versions called piano key weirs. It's easy to see how beneficial weirs can be from generating power to improving navigation. Control the flooding and even acting as the spillways of dams. With all those benefits, there are some downsides as well. Impactments across rivers affect the aquatic environment. Low head dams can also pose a serious danger to swimmers and boaters, a topic I'm going to discuss in the future. In fact, many of the years that are no longer needed are being replaced or completely removed to restore the river to its natural state. But as long as we need to control the flow of water in a constructed environment, readers will continue to be an important tool. Thank you for watching. And let me know what you think. Thanks to Skillshare for All right. What do you think? I like those. Those are beautiful.
<laughs> that'd be it'd be real refreshing uh, down there during the summertime. Has anyone seen these kinds of weirs before? Uh, they're, they're, the first time I saw this was in Georgia, uh, northern Georgia. And there's a reservoir up there, State Park. And I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. I took all these pictures of it. Um, and yeah, kind of makes sense, right? You get more um, length for the water to flow over, and um, you're not backing as much water up. So that's nice. Yeah. Right, because you could do it straight across or you can do the arch. The arch, you know, arch dams, I don't think it works that way for that type of um, labyrinth weir, but, you know, arch dams were created to put the forces, you know, take the forces of the flow and put them into canyon walls, right? Um, Hoover and, and Glen Canyon dams. Um, but it's cool to see an arch design actually just to increase length. So just some examples. Here's the Redlands Power Canal on the Gunnison River, just upstream of the confluence. Yeah, it's an OG dam. And Brady mentioned the dangers of these weirs. Um, they actually can be modified. And there's a professor out of Brigham Young, uh, Roland Hotchkiss. So one of his areas of research is modeling and then implementing designs that will create, that will counteract this recirculation that you see here. So if you were a kayaker or boater, you come down here, um, I think there's plenty of warning signs and stuff like that. You're not actually allowed to or supposed to come down this dam. Um, you, if you get caught up in this recirculating currents, um, it could very easily drown you because um, there's basically just this lateral whirlpool, right? Um, so that, that's what he was referring to. A lot of people do end up dying, unfortunately, in these kinds of situations. Um, so it's called kind of low head dams. Low head meaning they're not very tall. Um, they typically straddle rivers. So they're kind of a run of the river type of dam or weir. And um, if boaters encounter them, it can be very dangerous. We're gonna do some virtual board work and then we'll get back to some of those slides. Any thoughts or questions before we get into it? Wanted to ask while I'm thinking of it, I'd like to do an optional field trip Thursday after spring break to look at maybe the Redlands Canal or one of the others kind of from inlet through the system, um, talk about hydraulic structures, talk about open channel flow. A, a few of you email me back. Are there any others that'll be in town and interested in joining? Be Thursday during class time, probably go till four to five. I'd like to go. Great, okay. We got enough to do it then, sweet. Um, I will follow up with that. If you wouldn't mind just emailing me so I have a list of names to reach out to, I'll probably just email the whole class as details come, but just to keep track of that. Um, and if you do want extra credits in the class, um, we could talk about a short write-up of that. Um, if you're not able to attend and you do still want extra credit in the class, come contact me and we can, we can talk about something. Um, yeah, that would be fun. All right. Okay, so why, I guess we, we kind of got this introduction. Why, why, why do we have weirs? Why is it something we use? He didn't talk about one reason we, we do weirs. I mentioned that previously, but we, we use weirs to control water, to create hydraulic control of water, to raise the elevation of water so that we can divert it. Um, we have weirs to create flat pools of water. So if you look at the Mississippi River, it is essentially a system of weirs, of locks and dams that, um, at least in the lower Mississippi, allows barge traffic. So it fills the pool up and you just have flat water and you go down to the next level and so forth. And, and you can also work your way back up. 
Um, so for navigation, they kind of, they, they're very important. And we also use them, like I said, to measure water, to measure flow rates. So you saw that Weir equation. Discharge is a function of the Weir coefficients, the height of the water above the Weir, and the length of the Weir. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about right now. And we're going to derive the, um, a generic Weir equation, or ideal equ Weir equation. And I'll note that we are right now talking about what's called sharp crested weirs. It's kind of the most basic type of weir. It's any weir that has um, just a very sharp crest, right? This is not a perfect point, but um, it's a relatively narrow type of thing, right? There, it, of course, it's going to have some finite width associated with it. Um, and this is, uh, these weirs can take on many shapes. They could just be rectangular. In a simple case, they could be some kind of notched weir. Um, could be a V-notch weir. They come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. We also have broad crested weirs. And these are really any weir that has a, and there's an actual um, way to specify this, but it's any weir that has some sort of length downstream that's considerable or significant. We're going to be focusing on sharp crested weirs just to kind of reduce the amount of equations I'm throwing at you. Okay. Oh. All right, so let's go back to that sharp crested weir drawing. And so we know that weirs cause backwater. It's kind of a forced choke. That's the whole point. Maybe there's a hydraulic jump afterwards, something like that. And the weir, the whole point of choke, if we'll remember, is that it backs water up so that we get critical depth over the weir. So anytime you create a backwater and water's flowing over something, it's going to hit critical depth at some point over that weir. It'll transition to supercritical and then um, probably go through a hydraulic jump and go back to subcritical down here. All right, and then we're going to define some more parameters here. Um, Z will be the height of our weir, and then big H will be the depth of the water above the crest of the weir. And then now what we're interested in doing, um, I guess the other thing I'll define is the, the length parameter. So for just for a rectangular weir, The length is simply um, the width. So 
So from previous lectures, we know that at critical depth, there's some special stuff going on, right? So at critical depth, what is our food number? Y'all remember? One, all right, it's food number one. So at YC, our food number is equal to one, and that is equal to a velocity over square root of G Y. And then in this case, Y is YC, the critical depth. For rectangular channels, YC is equal to Q squared over G L squared. So the one third, and we derived a version of this. It was um, little Q over G to so the one third where big Q over length, or, or we used um, little b last time, remember, for the channel. But since we're talking about weirds, we're gonna use L. So Q over L, Q over bottom width is equal to little Q or discharge per unit width. All right, so this is just a, a relationship we divide, derived from essentially using the specific energy equation, taking the derivative of it, setting that to zero for a minimum and then solving for these terms. Um, and then we'll also remember that uh, the critical energy or the minimum energy for a particular flow rate in a particular, particular channel is equal to three halves YC. So that's just the, the relationship that falls out of that. Um, All right, so let's look at what happens between points one and point two at critical depth. And we're gonna look at the specific energy between these two things. So if we assume no energy loss, from point one to point two, um, then we can say that E1 is equal to the critical energy plus Z, the weir height. And we'll remember from that choked flow problem, we, we kind of did the same thing. We said, okay, if you put an obstruction in, it's kind of like standing in for the depth that you lost over that. Um, and it forces the flow to go to its minimum, uh, minimum energy level. Okay, so if we assume, uh, assume that there's no energy loss in that and then assume that V1 is very small. So the velocity up here coming in because um, the water is pooled. Then we can say that um, E1 is approximately just the flow depth, Y1, which is equal to H plus Z, right? So Y1 is equal to H plus Z. is equal to EC plus Z. We can cross these Zs out here. And then all of this, we go back to um, this EC is equal to three halves YC, um, three halves YC. So what we end up with is H should equal three halves YC. So that depth, that flow depth up here should approximate three halves YC. 
All right, so that's helpful. Uh, but now all that does is give us the, the relationship between the depth of flow above the weir and the critical flow depth. But ultimately, we want to bring it back to the discharge, the flow rate. So we'll just kind of leave that one right there. And we will bring back in a relationship between YC is equal to Q squared over GL squared. So one third, and then we can plug that in. So this equation, we're starting to get a weird equation. H is equal to three halves times Q squared, GL squared, so one third. Um, and then finally, we can solve for Q. And we get Q is equal to the square root of G times L times two thirds H to the three halves. Um, so this is the generic form of an ideal Weir equation. Of course, we can kind of take some of these constants out, right, and simplify it. Um, so what we end up with for the kind of most simple type of Weir, which again is this rectangular Weir. That's our H, this is our L. And this kind of weir we call an uncontracted weir. Uncontracted. Because it's not constricting the flow, right? It spans the entire channel width. So there's no flow constriction. The flow doesn't have to kind of come together to go through a, a contraction. So this would be a rectangular contracted weir right here. And the reason why we have contractions is to get basically more precision. There's a, a steeper rating curve, right? A steeper relationship between um, Q and H for these contracted weirs. And so you can, if your biggest uncertainty is measuring the flow depth, right? Then um, you'll get a, you know, instead of a, a one centimeter increase for CFS increase, you'll get a um, I don't know, 10 centimeter increase or something like that. So the rating curve for this one might look like this. And the rating curve for this one might look like this. Now, in, in that video, we introduced the term rating curve this is simply a relationship between um, stage or the height of water and discharge. And you, you see these all, all the time in hydraulic engineering and hydrology. And this makes sense. Remember in the video, he said that, um, so, so you don't back up a lot of water behind it for larger discharges, you want a flatter raining curve. Well, you increase the length, right? In this case, we have a, a shorter length. And so we get a steeper rating curve. So this is a contracted weir, just to be clear. So let's look at the some actual um, weir equations that we use. Um, so we'll just say the ideal. Um, uncontracted, uncontracted sharp crested rectangular weir. Got to be specific here. 
Um, we've got two, two weird equations. And so ideal really means, what, what, did, what does ideal mean? What do we not consider between points one and point two back here? Velocity. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's great. So we assumed that there was no velocity head. And we also assumed that there was no energy loss, remember? So these are two big assumptions that we made. So that's what makes this ideal. Um, and, and weirs are not ideal in reality. So we wanna be able to account for that. Uh, which means we end up with a weir coefficient, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so under ideal conditions, if you were to do square root of G um, and then two thirds to the three halves, you get Q is equal to 3.09 times L times H to the three halves in British gravitational units or US units. Um, and Q is in CFS. And this is feet and feet. And then under SI, that is 1.70 times L times H to the three halves. And this is CMS and meters and meters. Units, units, units. Um, so the, one of the challenges is that we in fact do have energy losses between that. And so we need to calculate Weir coefficients. And that's what we're gonna do in the Weir lab. Um, so we'll talk about that when it comes time. Um, so some of the some of the weird coefficients actually we'll just we're going to do some that right now. Okay, so for sharp crested. Here are some weird coefficients. Do, do. Um, and here's the generic equation. Q is equal to C times L times H to the three halves. And so if we look at this little figure here, Z is gonna be the height of the weir in the channel. H is of course the height of the flow above the weir, not at the critical flow depth, right? It's a little bit upstream. Okay, so we have to go a little bit upstream where it's pooled and, and you know horizontal. So given that generic equation, C is approximately 3.22 plus 0 0.4 H over Z. Okay, so that this, if you look back at um, the ideal equation, you have 3.09. Here um, we have to actually account for the fact that there's gonna be some energy losses and velocities related to the ratio of the flow depth over the weir and the actual height of the weir, right? So the taller the weir is, um, the closer we get to kind of ideal conditions where the velocity is below, but we also have to account for energy loss. And so this is BG and then C is equal to for SI 1.78 
plus 0 0.22 h over z. Um, so there's a ton of weir equations out there. There's um, weir equations for contracted weirs, um, V-notch weirs, trapezoidal weirs, right? So I'm not going to just go through them all. I'll, I'll post these notes. It's also in your book. Um, I will talk about two more types, though. And for a contracted rectangular weir, And this is, again, sharp crested. The generic equation is um, Q is equal to C times L over N H over 10 H to three halves, where we have a contracted rectangular weir. That's H, um, here's L. And N is equal to one if we have a one-sided contraction. And N is equal to two for two-sided. This is a this is two-sided right here. So one-sided would just be something like this, I guess. So the flow only has to contract from one side. So usually that N is just gonna be, uh, well, yeah, usually this is gonna be two over 10. So H over five. Um, So we'll just, um, typically we're, we're dealing with that kind of situation. All right, the last weir I wanna talk about and then we'll do an example together is uh, a broad crested weir. These are a little more funky, a little more um, hydraulics to account for. Um, so it, they're, they're more robust, right? It, you can think of this as like a concrete pad across a river channel. So they could handle maybe some more hydraulic forces than a sharp crested weir. Sharp crested weirs you could put in um, canals and stuff like that, small creeks. You couldn't put one in over a big river, right? It's just think of like a steel or concrete wall across a river. That's going to be a little bit more challenging to maintain. That's why we see OG weirs, they're kind of in between sharp and broad crested. Um, those hydraulics are a little more complicated, so we're gonna, for simplicity's sake, not talk about OG weirs, um, but broad crested, I just wanna introduce the concepts. So here is our broad crested weir. Here is our water. And depending on you know how big that crest is, the water might continue down to supercritical flow or might come back up. Make that a little bit better here. It's hard to draw straight lines on this thing. So this broad crested weir in cross section view is coming right across. Oh, 
Oh, sorry, that's not H. Um, and because the hydraulics are a little funky, we end up with a little more complicated equation where Q is equal to 0 0.433 square root of 2G Y1 over Y1 plus Z to the 1 half LH to the 3 halves. Okay, um, and then yeah, we got L that's kind of going into the river, across the river. So we'll we'll look at some more um, kind of weird design examples on the slides. Then we'll take a break. We'll come back. We'll do a problem together, and then we'll talk about this weird lab. Okay, so I just wanted to show you all some more examples of these sharp crested weirs. Here's our uncontracted, here's different contracted versions. We've got rectangular, triangular, trapezoidal. Each one has its own weir coefficients and equations based on uh, these angles and, and different kind of ratios of uh, height and width and stuff like that across the channel. The V1s I like a lot. They give you a really good um, relationship between stage and discharge for actually measuring in small creeks. Um, so those ones are nice, nice to have. Here's actually how we can design these. Um, and the reason why we, we want to design them in a certain way sometimes is that the, US, the USBR, so the US Bureau of Reclamation, They've got a bunch of manuals out there on weir design because they um, you know, helped create all the reservoirs and, and canals that keep the West in water. And part of that is measuring water, tracking the flow, right? So all these canals are gonna have flumes and weirs associated with them to help measure the flow. If you design the weir such that, um, you know, this width is less than three times the water height or the maximum water height, um, this width, or sorry, yeah, greater than three times the water height. So these, these three widths are greater than, and then this height or the Z height is greater than six times the water height, then the standard equation applies. And, and there's a standard equation in your book and, and I'll give it to you later. Same for this triangular one, if you have a 90 degree V notch and you create it such that the distance between the water's edge at the greatest flow um, and the bank is greater than two times this flow depth, and same for the Z value here, the CP, um, then the standard equation applies. And the reason why we want a standard equation is if you create a weir and it's not standardized, then you have to go out and calibrate it, right? You have to take discharge H measurements. That's what you're gonna actually do for this lab. So the calibration effort can be cumbersome, um, can be led to uncertainty, the standardized weirs we're combining labs under really controlled conditions. And so um, it's nice to create standardized things so that we can just use the pre-existing pre equations. There's trapezoidal weir. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about flumes. Flumes are another kind of way to control pre-hydraulic controlled conditions and measure flow. And the state of Colorado has an official plume. Montana has an official plume. Utah, I think they use a partial plume. Um, the partial flume is what we're seeing right here. This is actually a picture of the conversion ditch on a Grand Mesa. Um, if you go past Water Dog Reservoir across from Jumbo Lake and drive down a Rocky Road, it's a beautiful drive or white drive at night. Um, and you come out to this really awesome open area, kind of looking back towards the butt cliffs. 
And you might come across this little ditch. There's just kind of someone dug, it looks like with a shovel, um, across, across the plane. And this is metal flume here that uh, creates control of hydraulic conditions. The flow goes from um, subcritical to supercritical through there. And there's a measuring point where you can put like an actual scale in there to measure the flow depth and relate that back to discharge. Colorado has is starting to increase its automated discharge measurements and its water diversions. Um, they require for if you have a water right and divert water from river to have a plume so that someone can come out and say, yeah, you're only diverting five CFS. But people aren't often tracking this. It's just more of a thing to say, okay, um, if it's a drought and the water is low and you have a water rate that is junior to more senior water rates, and someone says um, it's called a call on, on a basin or a river, um, then you've got to shut off your, your water, or you can only you can't divert more than your water rate is decreed. And so that's what these plumes help measure. Um, so Ralph Purcell. Helped design this at Colorado State University back in the day using a slide rule and, um, and uh, lots of measurements and little ditches out here in Fort Collins. And if you go to CSU's campus outside of the engineering building, they've got this water fountain with uh, a bunch of different plumes as part of the water feature system. The commercial system is, is integrated there. Here's how the hydraulics work. We're not going to get into the design and use of these so much to do in life and in this class. Um, but here's the basic setup. So instead of a vertical contraction, we're doing a horizontal contraction. And you've got a little bit of a step down here. Um, you've got different points that you can measure that will create a, a nice, in this case, it's a nonlinear relationship between, well, I guess this one is too, um, between stage and discharge. Create a nice little hydraulic jump. And uh, you can put your scale right here and get, get some of these measurements. Um, so here's the rating curve for a modified partial plume. So the modified plume takes this section out, the downstream section. We don't care about it, but we're only measuring up here. And nothing downstream can influence up here because we go through super critical flow. Um, and so see that there is a nice linear relationship. Q is equal to 1.142H to 1.588. And we actually built a modified plume that the shop did downstairs for me. Um, did y'all see the mega plume out there in the parking lot? Might not see it, you might have leaned up against it. It's this huge modified partial plume that we ordered for a research project on the Mesa and it didn't account for how big it would be. Ordered, I think it was like a one foot plume that ended up being six feet tall. Um, so <laughs> redesigned it and got these out, right? This is why you have project managers and people who look over these things, um, which I should have done. Here's the modified partial flume. It's a little teeny tiny one. It's three inches across at the throat. Water's coming in here. It's stepping down, going through supercritical flow and then outlighting. And then we have a stilling well and a little scale. And then we're measuring the um, stage in the backwater here as well. So this is on a creek up on the Cedar Edge side of the Mesa. And um, this was part of research project tracking snow as it accumulates and melts off and, and tracking the hydrology of so the snow into the soil into the creek. All right. Let's take a few minute break and then we will do a problem together and talk about the lab. So for this weird design example, we're going to use a weir equation for the Cipolletti kind of weir, which is a trapezoidal weir. Um, it is standardized. It has a um, one to four ratio for the sidewalls. And then there's some other parameters in your textbook associated with what these widths and heights should be. Um, but as far as the weir equation is concerned, if you, you know, meet those design specs, this weir equation applies with this particular coefficient here. And so say you know that the maximum flow rate that a canal or, or stream is gonna have is about 28 CFS. 
and you don't want to backwater it more than 0.85 feet. So that can also allow you to figure out how tall this needs to be, right? Um, then what should the L be, the, the crest length be? Um, so really we're just, you know, solving for L, right? So go ahead and do that and I'll, I'll write it out up here. L is equal to Q over And then we just plug in our values. You'll notice that units kind of meaningless for Weir equations, similar to Manning's equation. These are empirical equations, the Weir coefficient came from laboratory experiments. If you go back to the ideal Weir equation, those units are homogeneous and actually track. Um, but when you, you know, do the square root of G and um, three halves or two thirds to three halves, all that stuff, you just kind of lump it together into a Weir coefficient. Um, you could actually figure out what the units are of this are supposed to be to make it dimensionally homogeneous, but we kind of ignore that. Um, I'll just say that it has embedded dimensions. So if we solve this, we end up with a crest length of 10.6. All right, so not, not rocket science here. 